So I'm Ayn Celestine. I'm Lestine. My image name is, I go by Arvid, Charlie. Well, for me, it goes back to when she says it's uh, Agnes, Billy, Eli used to tell us stories when we were, when we were small. So I'd be in the mid, late 40s, early 50s, and she, she, she talked about the yamlets every once in a while as being part of Komachin. So Komachin today is kind of at the lower part of the river, not the lowest, but the lower part. And she said they used to go all the way to what they now call Samana Hatsa, all one continuous village, kind of spotty, but that's what she told us. From the information I received from elders, including Siseiza, you know, that village was a long village, and uh, one of the things that was always said is that some of the people lived further away from the salt water, in this case, uh, Couchin Bay, uh, to be away from the first wind being raided if a, a raid should come. So some people lived further away from the salt water, that way they were in a more protected area, a more protected spot. So for that one, that was all part of Kwamutsen, which is Kwamutsen today. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a story. We were at a, a meeting talking about canoes and finding of canoes up in the hills 20 miles back from the salt water. And the guy joking, he said, oh, you guys must have had a hard time getting that canoe down to the, down to the water. You could have heard a pin drop and everybody was mad. Silence. And then in the background, you could hear Simon, my dad, kind of started chucking it. <laughs> and he says, yeah. Yeah, we had a hard time. And he kind of let them on for a while, let them on. Yeah, we had a hard time getting it down. And then later on he says, oh, and he said, we built big ropes to, for the canoes. But that wasn't to pull the canoe, that was to hold them back from taking off down the hill. <laughs> yes, we had a hard time getting them down, holding it back. <laughs> so. 20 miles back, that's not far, no. Mm -hmm. We weren't, if we got to a place late, like up the couch in Lake, we got there late, and now there's been a hill here, the elk have moved up, and there was lots of people, so, you know, a few will catch elk easily, others get there late. You gotta go follow them way up. And this is coming from Great Grandpa team. And if you are late, you go up, you get them. Wherever you catch your elk, you're going to camp there for at least two days. And you keep it, you strip the meat, you hang them up. Part of the hide is, is part of your, your uh, smokehouse. You smoke them for a couple of days or so. And two men can carry down the whole elk after you dry it. I know from experience that a medium-sized moose takes nine trips to carry it out. Nine trips. Well, a big elk would be the same amount. But uh, after it's dry, he said two men can carry it out. So I'll start with the stream, my great-grandfather. He talked about trips in the ocean. They went on the outside. Go down the outside for days, way past the big river. So the big river, if you look at the map, I believe would be Columbia River. Several days, not that far. We made it there in four days, paddling mm -hmm. on travel journeys. And um, he says, sometimes they got home, 
that same year and other times they come home the next year. And other times they never got home. Whether they were lost or were killed off or they stayed put somewhere, I don't know. And on a recent trip, we went down to Oregon. My last day we were there, I sat with a man from Cowlitz for breakfast. And having breakfast, he says, um, after talking to Father, he says, you know why we're called Cowlitz? No, I don't know why you're called Cowlitz. He says, well, a long time ago, you couch and used to come down here and go down further. We love those times, I'm squishing down to a shorter thing. We love those times because when you came, you left us big canoes. So in the journeys further south, one of the things we got was the thick abalone. That was a trade item. And the other thing is, um, things to make tools with, but I need to go to Kamloops for that, more on it. So one of the things that um, we know about, and I heard it many times from different elders, is our trips to Kamloops and Chase. We knew about it, I knew about it from my elders, but one day we were sitting a group who was in the 60s, late 60s. And George Manuel was with us. He was a man from Kamloops. He had one bad leg. And we're talking about trade. He said, you know, you guys used to get to Kamloops to trade clams. You guys even got up there with live clams. Now, I can't explain that, but I can guess. I'm talking to my mom, we had multi-walled baskets. And mom and I believed that, uh, you know, those are modern, or not modern, that was the cooler of the day as compared to the modern ones today. But to me, how did you keep it alive? Did we keep changing the water? Because they got to breathe. Yeah, you can keep clams for about three days and they'll die. So we aerated it somehow. So back to George Emanuel, he says, yeah. He guys got up there with clams, dried clams, and once in a while, red clams. So the things we traded up there, I'm told, was the rocks, I take it to be obsidian, from the south of the big Spatschen, and take the Spatchen to be prairies. Spatchen is open meadows, fields, that kind of thing. They came up and traded there, and we traded for that, for the knives and arrowheads. And also we were told that some of that material came from the other side of the big mountains. So what is the big mountains from Camelot from Chase? And again, it's me, I take it to be the Rocky Mountains on the other side. So is there a pigeon on the other side in Alberta? I'm told there is. So as far as trading for arrowheads, arrowhead material, yes, there was a lot of that going on. One of the things that I understand we really liked was um, Saskatoon berries that the Kamloops Chase people were able to to, they you said we got them in like layers of, sp like a spa, spa is, um, is uh, fish eggs. Mm -hmm. So they were like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yes, there was a lot of trading going on, yeah. Everything on, his, everything on our earth is connected. So, well, how's that blade of grass gonna sustain me? Well, something eats it. You eat that something and it just goes on and on. 
even to the worms you don't like, you know, the birds come and eat it, and someone else come and eat that bird, and, and so on. So everything is connected. So when you ask about the meadows, under those scary oak trees back there, it's, it's all part of our, it's part of what sustains us. Mm -hmm.